Welcome back. Late last week, Congress passed a funding measure that will keep the government open for another 45 days, as aid to Israel and Ukraine are still being held up and conservatives in the House are rejecting efforts to increase border security. This week, I spoke to South Florida Congressman Jared Moskowitz, and I started with a simple question. Is Congress doing anything right now? No, nothing's getting done, Jim. This is the least productive Congress in 30 years. It's by the numbers, so math, right? I mean, we've, we've passed 30 bills. Um, you know, the pace for or an average year, an average Congress is about 300. So we're way behind, uh, way behind that pace. Obviously, this has been just a dysfunctional Congress. It's been completely chaotic. My colleagues across the aisle, when they when they find time to fight with the Democrats, you know, it, it's far and few between because they're fighting with themselves. And meanwhile, you know, uh, our allies, Ukraine and Israel, are still waiting for us uh, to help them uh, in 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 a funding bill that we've not been able to get done. What are our allies thinking around the world? What are our enemies looking at and figuring out how they're going to take advantage? So this this Congress has created such a mess for the American people. There seemed that, that there were some negotiations in the Senate to try to you know, give some, the Democrats giving on some issues with regard to immigration, particularly on policy reforms, not just additional funding, but it seems to not have a lot of support among Republicans in the House. Where is immigration standing right now? On the border and on immigration, there is bipartisan agreement that there is an issue at the border, major issues at the border, and that we can solve it. If you listen to John Thune and Lindsey Graham, conservative members of the Senate, they're working on the most conservative border policy to come out of the Senate in a generation. And I'm willing to vote for it. I'm willing to, to work with them in the Senate and my colleagues in the House to do something uh, at the border, because this has been decades in the making, failure after failure, administration after administration, Congress after Congress, not willing to, to address this. For a very long time, Democrats refuse to even acknowledge that there was a crisis on the border. The fact that Democrats are now talking about the border as a crisis, you know, in part, I think, is, is, is reflecting the reality of what voters are now saying is their most important issue, which includes the economy and immigration. Were Democrats late to recognize the problems on the border? Well, look, I just got here, so I've only been here a year. So and I've been talking about the border since I since I got here. As far as Democrats, no. Barack Obama deported more people in each of his two terms than President Trump deported uh, in his term. President, President Obama deported, you know, like a million more people in, in a, in a four-year term than, than President Trump did. So Democrats have been talking about this and dealing with the border. The, the issue is that it's become politicized, Jim, just like a lot of other issues up here, which is no one wants to solve problems when the other person is in charge because they don't want to give the other team a win. And that's kind of what's happening in the House now. Going back to your previous question, what's happening in the House now is I have colleagues who have been ginning up the border issue all year, talking about a crisis, talking about fentanyl, which is a real issue, right? We have kids dying from fentanyl in this country. My predecessor, Ted Deutsch, his nephew died uh, from an accidental fentanyl overdose. And now many of my Republican House colleagues are coming out and admitting they don't want to do anything on the border. They'll vacate the chair. They'll vacate the new speaker if he tries to solve the border because they don't want to give Joe Biden a win. They don't want to do it before the election. They want to do it. Be, they, they, they want to listen to Donald Trump, who wants the border to get worse so he can use it as an election issue rather than solve the problem. Lastly, I just want to get your reaction to the Iowa caucuses. Uh, Donald Trump uh, securing more than 50 percent of the uh, Republicans. Granted, it was a low turnout, about 105,000, typically 180,000 in 2016. Uh, but the cold weather kept people home. Ron DeSantis finished second, it's declared some sort of moral victory by receiving 20, basically 21 percent of the vote, 30 points behind Donald Trump. Uh, what did you make of the Iowa caucus results? Well, look, this is the strangest, right, political season I think we've we've ever seen, right? If you talk to some Republicans, they don't think Joe Biden's going to be the nominee. And if you talk to some Democrats, they don't think Trump's going to be the nominee. And they're both going to be the nominee. This is where we're headed. We're headed to a, a redo of Trump versus Biden. And so what I make of, of the results in Iowa is the same thing I knew before Iowa and I know after Iowa, that the Republican Party is going to put up Donald Trump yet again. And that's because when it comes to a primary Republican voter, right, Donald Trump has a hold 
uh, over over that party. It, it, it's something that we can't explain, Jim, because we've never seen it in modern times in this country. S someone ha have people so beholden to him, regardless of the facts, regardless of the chaos that surrounds him, regardless that he's lost everything that he's touched since his first victory uh, in, in 2016. Uh, and so that's where we're headed here. You know, we'll see what happens in New Hampshire. We'll see what happens in Nevada. We'll see what happens in South Carolina. So it may drag out maybe a little bit longer. But at the end of the day, when Super Tuesday happens, Trump is going to clean up and Trump is going to be the nominee of that party. Trump is going to be the nominee. You said Joe Biden is going to be the nominee, both of which the vast majority of Americans do not want to see. They do not want to see a rematch. You know, let me let me try not to get you in too much trouble on the Democratic side. But at what point does a politician like a Joe Biden recognize that it's time to to exit? He, he accomplished exactly what he wanted to in 20 by saying, you know, I'm the person who can bring bring civility and therefore I'm the best choice, the best option in 20. I don't know that he's truly the Democrats best option in 24. And I think that if it's a rematch, you know, I think the Democrats are playing with fire. And I do think there are other Democrats out there who would have a much easier time defeating Donald Trump than Joe Biden. I, I guess I just want to get your reaction to at what point do they just recognize we saw it with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. I don't think the situations are analogous only because that was a strategic error because we could have appointed someone when we when we had control at, at, at that time. Right. That was an easier thing. And in hindsight, look, she's appointed for life. Ruth Bader Ginsburg has a tremendous legacy. That was her decision. But obviously, when you look back now, you think to yourself, boy, how different could it, could it have been? What could we have prevented? In this instance, Jim, I mean, we're just back in a situation where the only one who could beat Biden might be Trump, and the only one that could beat Trump might be Biden. And I really think that that is the calculus here, is, is that Joe you really Biden- think, You really think the only Democrat that could beat Donald Trump is, is Joe Biden? You don't think a J.B. Pritzker, a Gretchen Whitmer, a Gavin Newsom, somebody from a new generation, because I think that's, I mean, I think a lot of voters are ready for that generational shift. Well, by the way, this is a problem in both parties right now. They're, bo they're both to, about to nominate, you know, the people that got their AARP card, you know, decades ago already. So, I mean, you know, that's just where we are in politics. Both parties, you know, would like to move on to the next generation. But if, you, if you're President Biden, you look at the accomplishments that he's had uh, in his four years, especially in the first two years when they had had Congress. And then you look at the fact that he beat President Trump. Right. And I think that's where the majority of Democrats are. The majority of Democrats want to go with someone who has done it before so that we can do it again. Some of those other folks just they don't they don't have the platform. They don't have the name ID. Uh, they don't have the experience going up against Trump going up against Trump, by the way. Is, is something that you're not prepared for until it happens, right? And you gain that experience through trial by fire, quite frankly. This idea that you can just prepare to go against him and without ever doing that. Joe Biden's done that. Joe Biden's done those debates. He's done that campaign uh, and, and has that experience. And I think that's why Democrats are putting up Joe Biden, uh, quite frankly. And, and I think we're going to, I think Joe Biden's going to win the election because I think the American people, some people will go in and vote for Joe Biden. Some people will go in and vote against Donald Trump. But I think that coalition together is why we'll ultimately beat Donald Trump. When we come back, a few thoughts about the current state of disrepair at Miami International Airport. That's right after the break. <laughs> 